Well, we're going to go ahead and get started a little early so we can have some more time to do some traveling tonight. We left you with the <coughs> memory verse, Psalm 29 and verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name, and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29 and verse 2, which is what the book of Psalms basically is about, because something I didn't mention last time, but we said in earlier messages with other connections, is that the book of Psalms, or Sefer Tehillim, they didn't call it Psalms, they called it Praises, so you'd be a little more correct if you called it Praises, the book of Praises, was just that. It was the hymn book for the Old Testament church as well as the New Testament church. That doesn't mean they had only 150 hymns because you could divide all of the 150 hymns up per verse and get a hymn out of a verse like we did out of Psalm 118 and verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. They sang the whole song. And all we have taken is one verse for that song anyway. We sing other verses out of that particular praise, but... We've taken one verse, verse 24 out of Psalm 118, and made a song or a hymn out of it. So this was the hymn book, and I might add, it sure does beat most hymn books that I've ever seen before, Amen. because it's filled with encouragement. Even when David starts off discouraged, he ends up encouraged by the time he gets through praying his prayer or singing his song. He just had to get himself warmed up. Now, we're looking right now at the three uh, poetical books, which is the first division of the Hagiographa. And the Jews call these three books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, I'll give it to you in English, truth, because you take the first few letters of each one of the Hebrew words for Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, and you end up with the English word truth. So... That might be interesting, just as a side note for you. Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, although they were three different books, even considered by the Hebrews to be three different books, they still called all of them together the Book of Truth, because basically this is where we find our poetic and wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Now, I'd also given you the fivefold division based on the Pentateuch. Book one was... Psalm 1 through 41. Book 2 was Psalm 42 through 72. Book 3 was Psalm 73 through 89. Book 4 was Psalm 90 through 106. And Book 5 was 107 through 150. Now remember at the, each, at the end of each one of these, such as Psalm 41 and verse 13, we have a concluding doxology that concludes that portion of the book of Psalms. Now, we've looked at these verses last time. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. But there's something else interesting about this particular division, and that is the occurrence of the two names of God, Yahweh and Elohim. Remember back in Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, there was a little play on the name there. You find Elohim, then you go to Yahweh Elohim, and then you go to Yahweh by the time you get to chapter 4. Well, let me give you the statistics for the twofold name of God, Yahweh Elohim, here in the five books of Sefer Tehillim. The first book, God's name is Yahweh, appears 273 times. It's always disproportionate, by the way. Yahweh appears 273 times, whereas the name Elohim only occurs 15 times. There are always these marked divisions, except uh, there's one exception right in the middle of the book, which would be the third book of Sefer Tehillim. Then in book two, well, it's just the reverse. Yahweh is found 30 times, and Elohim is found 164 times. Then in book 3, it evens out. 
Yahweh is found 44 times and Elohim 43 times. Then in book 4, which would be Psalms 90 through 106, Yahweh appears 103 times and Elohim appears zero times. And then in 107 through 150, again, Yahweh predominates 236 times in comparison to Elohim recurring seven times. So again, you can see another basis for the division here, not only the concluding doxology, but the choice of God's name, depending upon who the author was and depending upon when he was writing and depending upon the circumstances of his writing. Because in books 1, 2, and 3, you'll find Psalms of David, but yet even his choice of name is disproportionate. Let me give you one example of what I mean here. If you'll turn back to Psalm 14. Psalm, Psalm 14, not 114. Psalm 14. Along with Psalm 53. <clears throat> now, if you know anything about Psalms, you know that these names are, or these Psalms are, practically identical with I think one verse added on over in Psalm 53 you've got a little more material but anyway notice what it says Psalm 14 the fool has said in his heart there is no God they are corrupt and so forth Psalm 53 the fool has said in his heart there is no God and so forth but in Psalm 14 Yahweh is the name which is used and in Psalm 53, Elohim is the name that is used. So they're almost identical, but you've got a change of the name of God, which is one of the things the critics want to base their disunity of authorship upon. But as we've seen early in, in the Pentateuch, that really doesn't have anything to do with one author, Moses, writing Genesis 1, but then another author writing Genesis 2 and 3, since you've got Yahweh Elohim. Mm -hmm. And then another author writing Genesis 4, since now you go just to the singular name, the covenant name of God is Yahweh. The purpose of the book of Psalms is very easy, to provide an example of worship and praise acceptable for use in offering thanksgiving to God. To provide an example of worship and praise which is acceptable for the use of offering thanksgiving to God. Many of the great hymns of the church and of course many of our songs have been taken right here out of the book of Psalms. Those that they sang over in the New Testament, book of Acts, first century church were taken out of the book of Psalms. So it does give you a, a proper way to express praise and worship to God. Now it doesn't always have to be something like uh, Psalm 146 to 150, which you can tell right away, or Psalms of praise, or Psalm 34 like we've seen. Even the anonymous first Psalm is a praise to God, you might not have thought of it as being that. It's didactic, but it's also a praise because that's pretty much what all of them are. They don't have to say, in other words, praise God in order to praise God. You can praise him in other ways. If you're charismatic, you know there are many different ways to praise God. Amen. The book of Psalms chapter 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, he's magnifying the right ways and the righteous ways of the Lord here. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. So now he's praising his word, as well as the faithful servant of God. And in his law that he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper, and so forth. 
And you can go into each one of them and still find, even though you might find the author in the depths of despair to begin with, it still ends up as some type of acceptable praise and worship and adoration of him, which is what you ought to be using the book of Psalms for. Amen. Because none of us were taught by our denominations how to worship. Amen. We were taught what not to do if Amen. you want to worship God. <laughs> but the book of Psalms is what you need to be reading if you want to find out how you should worship Amen. God. Amen. I might remind you of the fact that it was only said of one man, and that being David, that he was one after God's own heart. Amen. So there's probably something interesting to find in the 73 Psalms that we know David wrote. More than that, but 73 by the Hebrew titles that we have here. He's called that over the New Testament, the man who is after God's own heart, Amen. Acts chapter 13, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you can find out something about how that can be said of you. You can find out something about King David. Hallelujah. We come next of all to the authorship of the Psalms. Most people naively believe from Sunday school that David wrote all the Psalms. And nothing could be more fallacious than that belief. But I never, when I was raised in Sunday school, had any idea that anyone wrote any psalms beside David, because I thought, according to 2 Samuel 23, that he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And that meant that he wrote all the psalms. Well, you might be in for a little of a surprise, because according to the names that we have here in the book of psalms describing certain psalms to various authors he didn't even write half of them let alone all of them all 150 of them he didn't even write half of them according to the titles that we have here so that's a naive belief to think that david was the one who wrote all the psalms david is the instigator of the liturgical form of worship among the levites because he's the one that invented uh, various musical instruments as well as various ways of expressing oneself in Hebrew poetry David is the one who's called the originator of these things so certainly a lot of this is going to be done by him but not all of it let me give you a breakdown of what we know from the Hebrew title the superscription concerning the authorship of the song of course at the very top of the list will be David with 73 psalms not even half of them of 150 that we have second behind him would be asaph you remember who asaph was in the old testament some of you probably don't even remember 12 psalms ascribed to asaph you can look him up in your concordance and find out about asaph thirdly the sons of korah you remember who they were? Ten songs ascribed to them. We could spend several weeks just on introduction to the psalms because there's that much material that you give an introduction. Amen. Now, on Obadiah, you run out after a while. There's only, <laughs> there's only so much you can say in introduction. And generally, you're already through all 21 verses of the whole book before you're through with your introduction. This is not true with some. So I'm just giving you some of the, uh, the outstanding characteristics. We could get into a lot of uh, other things concerning psalms that we'll look at in wisdom and poetic literature. Then King Solomon. Well, you know he wrote a lot of Proverbs. Remember, he wrote uh, several songs himself. And he's got two psalms which bear his name. Then Ethan and Heman both wrote one. We study about them back in uh, I think First Kings. Uh, I think First Kings four. Moses wrote one, and you get all it added up, and that leaves you with fifty anonymous psalms, or we can call them orphan psalms because they don't have a father in the Hebrew title. 73 for David, 12 for Asaph, 10 for the sons of Korah, 2 for Solomon, 1 for Moses, 1 for Ethan, 1 for Heman, and 50 orphan songs. 
Now let me make a comment or two about the titles that we find here in the Psalms. I believe that all of the Psalms except 34 of them, which would be the vast majority of them, I believe that number is correct, have some type of title that go along with them. Since you're in the beginning of Psalms, just look at Psalm 4. For the chief musician on Neginos, the Psalm of David. So there you've got what we call a title or a superscription to the Psalm. And generally in the Hebrew, the superscription or the title, depending upon the length of it, will comprise either the first or the first and the second verses of the Psalm which means that in the Masoretic text or in texts that deal with the book of Psalms according to the Hebrew language rather than according to our translation into the English, will in all the Psalms that have titles, which would be the vast majority of them, have either one or two uh, more verses than what you will have. A Psalm like Psalm 18 has a title that's a little bit too long. So you might end up I didn't check it out on this psalm, but just for an example, because I remember this is a long title here, you might have two verses in the Hebrew, the Masoretic text, that would be relegated uh, to the title that we have here, which would mean that they would end up with 52 verses for that psalm in opposition to our 50 verses. Now, the temptation is to get into a, a detailed study of the titles of the Psalms, which temptation we're going to avoid because it's so controversial, but I'll just go ahead and say without trying to prove it that the titles that we have in the Psalms are extremely, extremely ancient. They go back way before the LXX, which would put them back before 250 B.C. Now, it doesn't appear as if they were part of the original authors composition of whatever psalm, but they were added very, very shortly thereafter. Now, even if it was several hundred years, that's still very shortly thereafter in comparison to how long we've had the book of Psalms available to us. And since they go back so far into antiquity, we, without reservation, trust, for the most part, what has been said here in the titles. They're very, very important because they give us a lot of information about the psalm. Now, most of the critics will say that these were added, you know, hundreds of years later, and they're false. They don't have anything to do with the psalm. They were added by some admirer of the author of the psalm, and therefore should be struck out of the text and out of our Bible. But since they're found all the way before the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament into Greek, it's safe to assume that most of what has been provided for us here is certainly correct, and therefore it's very, very important that we keep these there in our Bible, know something about them. Now, they're just filled with all types of musical words and technical liturgical words that, of course, you'll never understand unless you study them. Well, such as what we've got here in Psalm 4. What's the genos mean? Or what about over in Psalm 69? Shushanim. And you can find some words more difficult than those that are found here in the titles of the Psalms that all have important technical, liturgical, musical, uh, directional meanings that, of course, we can't get into here in this little introductory time that we have with the book of Psalms. But while we're here on the authorship, uh, go over to... Well, I'll have to find one. Well, Psalm 46. Well, really, we need to go back to 42. Remember, this begins the second book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. Psalm 42. To the chief musician, Maskil, for the sons of Korah. So now you've already gotten beyond David other psalms written by other authors. You go right into 44 and 45, and of course this whole section here is dealing with uh, some of those uh, 10 psalms I gave you that would belong to the sons of Korah. Now if you notice that 43 doesn't have a title, it's because really 42 and 43 go together. It's all right to keep them divided, but it's really one psalm because uh, you'll see the same thing said back in 42 that's repeated in 43. 
And there are other songs like that. I just give you these things as I go along because I remember them, but a lot more could be said if we were going to give you a completely exhaustive list of where each thing was to go and certain things were not to go. Uh, Psalm, if you turn over to Psalm 75, for example, now we're away from the sons of Korah. We've got a psalm or a song of Asaph. Psalm 76, 77, 78, and so forth. Going right on through 83. Then we get back to Psalm 84. Now we're back to Korah. 85 Korah. 86. Now we've got a psalm or a prayer of David stuck in. You can look in your titles here and see this. 87, we're back to Korah. Now if you'll turn to Psalm 88, this is one of the unique ones. A song or psalm for the sons of Korah to the chief musician upon Mahalath Leanos Maskil of Heman, the Ezraite. So here we've got our psalm of Heman. You go over to Psalm 89, and there we've got our psalm of Ethan. You go over to Psalm 90. This is the oldest of all the psalms, by the way. Psalm 90 is the oldest of all the psalms. How do we know that? Well, look who the author is. He lived before all the other authors, so he it has to be the oldest Amen. psalm, obviously. Amen. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. So here it's not called a song or a psalm or a praise, but it's called a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Now, if you do some study in extra biblical literature, like we will be doing whenever we get back on that series that we postpone, we'll study some things about the Talmud, and the Talmud has a, just filled with fanciful Jewish notions about, well, about a whole lot of things. And one of the things is that not only did we have our authors that I've given you, I think they exclude uh, Solomon as an author for some of the Psalms, but they also add Adam, which wrote... Uh, what psalm was that? Psalm 139, Adam allegedly wrote. Mm -hmm. Abraham wrote a psalm. I forget which one the Talmud said Abraham wrote. And Melchizedek. So they add three more authors there, Adam, Abraham, and Melchizedek. Adam wrote Psalm 139. Uh, Melchizedek, of course, would have written Psalm 110. And I don't remember which one Abraham wrote. But that's not true because we don't have that uh, here in our superscriptions or titles for the song. Oh, now, it's generally believed by those that, that do any thinking about Psalm 90 that Psalm 91 is, is so close to Psalm 90 in its theme of protection. Uh, this is what Psalm 90 is talking about, protection, that probably Psalm 91 was also written by Moses, the man of God, which would give him two psalms. So we don't know that because Psalm 91, of course, is titleless. It has no superscription. But you could go back to your list of authors of the Psalms and add a possibility for one extra one for Moses. Psalm 90, definitely, because the Hebrew in the title gives us that. But Psalm 91, there's a great probability and possibility because it deals with the same subject as Psalm 90. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So they seem uh, to go together, especially in the first verse. Behold, or before the mountains were brought forth forever, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And he goes on to teach about one security in his Creator, which is the same thing Psalm 91 is saying. Let's see. I haven't found one for Solomon. We've got a couple of them for Solomon. He wrote one over in Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain and so forth. Amen. So that's uh, a psalm of King Solomon. 
If you'll go over to Acts chapter 4, I want to show you how the New Testament even names some of the Psalms as belonging to David. And no doubt some of that group of 50 orphan Psalms probably were also composed by David. So the only reason we restrict it to 73 as having been written by the sweet psalmist of Israel is because that's all that the uh, Hebrew titles in Sefer Tehillim give us. But if you look in Acts chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, you'll see how not all the time, but sometimes, whenever you've got a New Testament author quoting a psalm of David, then he'll say that it is a psalm of David. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, you turn back to Psalm 2 and verse 1, which, by the way, is titleless, so we know here we've got 174 Psalms now by David. This is just to give you one example. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Just what uh, the people in Acts chapter 4 are praying. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? And they said, you said this by the mouth of your servant David. But nowhere in Psalm 2, or I should say nowhere before Psalm 2, does it say that David was the author of Psalm 2. But since the New Testament tells us that, then we can add one more to the name of David. And no doubt Psalm 1, since it's the introduction to the whole book, was probably also written by David. He is the author of the book insofar as he's the author of, of the majority of the Psalms as far as which ones fall under the various categories of the different authors. So there's certainly no reason to believe that anyone except David would have written Psalm 1. I mean, David would have known this because the same thoughts that we find in Psalm 1 are echoed almost word for word later in some of the Psalms that we know to be Davidic. Let's see. Um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 25. David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, and he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. And that's Psalm 16. And I believe uh, verse 8. I set the Lord always before me, he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved doesn't give us another addition to David because we already have David there. Romans chapter 4. Not all of them, when they quote Psalms in the New Testament, do this, but sometimes they do. Romans 4 and verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered, and blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's from the first few verses with some minor subtractions of Psalm chapter 32. Then Acts 1, 16 through 20. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was to guide them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry, so forth, down to verse 20 now. This is what we want because he's quoting some earlier things there. Verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, and he already said in verse 16, it's, it was said by the mouth of David, then let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his office let another man take. That's from Psalm 69, as well as Romans 11, verses 9 to 10. This passage also comes from Psalm 69. Romans 11, verses 9 to 10. 
See, I'm talking almost nonstop here, and we're barely going to get through with the material I have, and you could do this several more weeks and still just be covering introduction to the book of Psalms because it's the largest book in the Bible. Romans chapter 11, verse 9, David saith in Psalm 69, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, and let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. So that's just a few examples of what we've got in the New Testament when the one who's doing the quoting from some Old Testament of the Jews and of the early Christian church. Remember what the name means. It's not called Psalms. It's Peter, Tehillim, the book of praises. So it was filled with praises, which obviously you would sing with musical accompaniment. Another characteristic, both the shortest and the longest chapters in the Bible are found here. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117 is not only the shortest, but also the middle chapter of the Bible. Another characteristic, you might find different statistics from different authors because it depends on what restrictions you put on your definition of a quotation, but I'll give you what one author said. There are 283 Old Testament quotations found in the New Testament. 116 of them are from Sefer Tehillim. Now that all, you see, those statistics there, you'll probably find different ones among different authors because of all the what they define as a quotation. I mean, obviously, when it says David saith, and he takes it almost word for word, that's a quotation. But some will spill over into the area of illusion and make the illusion synonymous with the quotation, and therefore you're going to end up with a higher number. So it all depends on what your definition of a quotation, an Old Testament quotation in the New would be. But one author recognizes 283 OT quotations in NT and 116 of them are from Sefer Tehillim. Another characteristic, as I said in the titles, is the great variety of liturgical terms and musical words which are found. And I'll just give you the two most frequent ones. One of those is uh, to the choir director, which occurs over 50 times. Now that's found in the title. And then the most frequently occurring one is the Hebrew word silah. S-E-L-A-H, Selah, which occurs 71 times. Sometimes, I remember at least on one occasion, right in the middle of a verse, generally at the end of a verse, but at least on one occasion, right in the middle of a verse, 71 times. Now, this word is only found in one other place in the Bible. Where is that? Habakkuk. He found three times in the book of Habakkuk. The only other place it's found in the Bible is Sefer Tehillim and Habakkuk, if we just stay with the Hebrew pronunciations of all the books. Habakkuk three times, 71 times, and Sefer Tehillim. What does it mean? Well, I could say your guess is as good as mine, but mine would be more educated than yours. <laughs> so my guess would probably be better than yours. Psalm chapter 3, if you'll look here, for instance, it's a word that, that's so old, long before the LXX, it was occurring there just like the titles were, that we don't really know what the word means. To some it means silent, be silent at this point. 
To others, it means to change a pitch in your voice. To others, it means a musical interlude. To some, it means change, you know, some type of, uh, go to a different chord in whatever, on whatever string instrument you're playing upon. And uh, so it's really hard to determine. It means one of those things. We're almost positive that it means one of those three or four things that I just gave you. Possibly it simply means a musical interlude here, where you would have a brief moment of silence. And this is what the word was signifying. Now, <laughs> we always read the word, but of course you don't read an interlude. I mean, you do what it says, which is be silent. So if you read the word, you'd be disobeying what the word says. But we'll probably still continue to read the word when we read Psalms because it's there. But if you're putting this to music, then you don't put Selah into your song. Now, we have been blessed by the Spirit with a great number of the psalms put to music by various people here in the body. So let me warn you ahead of time, don't put Selah in your song. Because if you put Selah in there, we'll all be quiet when you get to it and let you sing it. Because it means to be quiet. So don't be caught singing off key by yourself. <laughs> Psalm 3 and verse 2, I'll just warn you ahead of time. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept, I awake, for the Lord sustained me. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. So you'll have another musical interlude, another pause there. It goes right on down into Psalm 4, verse 4. Now you won't find this in every psalm. Like in Psalm 1, you don't find it there. But you find it 71 times. And uh, we'll just leave it with that meaning. If I come up with anything better, then we'll change our opinion of what the word means. I doubt you won't get into the kingdom if you believe that Selah means a musical interlude when really it means a change of pitch in the voice, though. But uh, there's no sense in studying the word if you're not going to be correct when you study it. So we trust that we're correct there at that point. And there's no sense of a word appearing there and you not know what the word means. So anyway, enough said on Selah. There are 14 psalms, another characteristic, which give us historical background information for the composition of that song. We can again say right here where we are in Psalm 3. There are at least 14 of the psalms that give historical background information. In other words, they tell us the circumstances uh, surrounding the composition of the song by whoever the author might be. So, we know, so we'll know why he composed this particular song. And therefore, we can use it in, in the same or similar situation as the author meant for the psalm to be used because this is when he sat down and composed it. Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Now, you know what the psalm is about because we sing a song from it. And it talks about fleeing from one's enemy. And finally, he gets down in verses 5 and 6, and he's not going to be afraid even when he goes to sleep. Because remember, uh, Absalom had taken over the king's harem, his concubines, the whole city, Mount Zion. He had taken over everything and gained the allegiance of some of David's former friends. And David, along with some of his friends who had remained his friends, which proved to be true friends after all, had to flee uh, east of Jordan to try to get away from Absalom. And they were going from one place to another trying to stay free from Absalom. And so this is when David is composing this because his life depends upon God protecting him or he's going to end up dying a very short death. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. You ever thought of seeing that after your mother or dad calls on the <laughs> telephone? Well, that's yeah. when David was writing the psalm. <laughs> Relative problems. Amen. Problems from relatives. And he said, Lord, how are they increased? Now it's cousins and uncles, nieces, nephews, and many are they that rise up against me. 
Many there be which say of my soul, oh, it, it won't work. Faith doesn't work like that. You'll probably die. You better get medical attention quickly before that disease spreads too far. Well, there is no help for him in God. Then the best thing to do is, is see them whenever they're on the phone. Amen. <laughs> and sing the psalm whenever you get off the phone. <laughs> but thou, O oh Lord, art a shield for me. <laughs> my glory and the lifter up of mine head. Well, that's like Hebrews 12. Lift up those feeble knees and hands. Lift the head up. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Then he goes on to say, I had peaceful sleep, and I'll not be afraid of ten thousands of people. Verse 7, I pray that you smite my enemies upon the cheekbones. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. Hallelujah. Well, let's find another one. Psalm 7. Shigion of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush the Benjamite. So you've got some historical background information. Psalm 18 is a good example. You never knew there'd be so much teaching, you see, right in the titles of the psalm. They're just full of information here in the titles. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and he said, I think this is the only one that you've got an introduction to the first verse in the English version, by what's been given us in the title because it says and he said and it goes right on into the psalm then i will love thee o lord my strength and so forth uh psalm 34 a psalm of david when he changed his behavior before abimelech who drove him away and he departed <laughs> remember it says he let fiddle run down on his beard and he scrabbled on the floor and scrabbled on the door and he said why have you brought this madman <laughs> unto me and so David was able to escape as a result of that well it's after he escaped after he played the madman before Abimelech that he said I will bless thee I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. Well, he ought to know. He just had gotten delivered a couple of hours probably before this. He keepeth all of his bones. He means he keepeth all of my bones. Mm -hmm. And none of them are broken. The Lord redeemeth my soul, and I will not be desolate because I trust in him. Hallelujah. You see, these are personal psalms, but a lot of them are written so that others can enter into the benefit. So that's why he says, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants. And really, he's talking about me. God redeems my soul. Amen. And none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Well, I'm not desolate because I have trusted in him. Amen. I remember one Amen. other psalm. This is not historical information, but it's interesting title, and that is Psalm... Uh, Psalm 92 has an interesting title to it. A psalm or a song for the Sabbath day. So we know that Psalm 92 was one that they sang specifically on their day of rest and day of worship with Psalm 92 because it says this is one for the Sabbath day. Under characteristics, let me give you what are the two major themes all the other things that you'll find in Psalms will fit under two major themes. And it's interesting what they are, just what we stress around here all the time. That is faith in God in the midst of trial, tribulation, and persecution. Faith in God. How many times have you read the Psalms and you see him expressing faith in God, not when everything is going well, but faith in God in the midst of trial, tribulation, persecution. There's nothing that makes the devil any matter than not to be able to get you to lose the victory when he's bringing all types of trial and tribulation. So this is, this is one of the two great themes of Psalms, the 
total faith, a total trust, a total reliance in and upon the Lord in the midst of trial, tribulation, and persecution. And then the second theme, which follows right on the heels of that, is the praise of God for his glory and for his deliverance Hallelujah. of his servant. So what are the two themes? Faith and praise. What the whole Bible is built around and what we're con constantly reminding you of and emphasizing here is faith and praise. That's two ways, two of the best ways to get the victory is Amen. faith and praise. Faith and praise. They go just about hand in hand. You have faith in the trial and of course even the faith in the trial means that you're praising him through the trial. Amen. But then you see in the Psalms that it's after the trial is over with that they really bring forth great praise for him. Amen. Now there are some other themes that we see. Let me give you some of these. God's mercy. One of the very prevalent themes is his wrath against the wicked. His providence, his wisdom, his majesty, and so forth. But notice all those are going to fit somewhere. They're going to fit under faith in God in the midst of trial and tribulation, or they're going to fit under the praise of God, where even though you've got the wicked in the world, then you know that the wicked have been made for the day of judgment and the day of punishment. And God gets glory in the wicked because his justice and his righteousness is manifested when he is able to punish the wicked for committing sins in the sight and in the presence and before the face of a holy God. So all these things will fit somewhere under faith and praise. They go together. One other characteristic is the fact that many times the book of Psalms and the individual praises found therein serve as commentaries upon other portions of the Older Testament, oh, yeah. such as Psalm 105. I've got something to teach on this one of these years or days, but I'll just give you the verse, Psalm 105 and verse 41. Now, we didn't get this back earlier. Remember what we got earlier concerning the striking of the uh, rock with the rod and it says that water gushed out well what happened then he opened the rock and the waters gushed out and they ran in the dry places like a river Three. and most people don't realize that the water that came out of the rock actually turned into a whole river and it flowed and kept them nourished and kept them sustained now you wouldn't have gotten that earlier from the Pentateuch all you think of is you know a water fountain that everyone bends over and gets a drink from the water fountain. Can you imagine how long it takes three million people to get a drink from stepping on the button and pushing the water out? You'd be there until the cows come home trying to get a drink of water there. And that doesn't include the cows when they got home getting their own drink of water. You would have been wandering in the wilderness for many times, 40 years. And it wouldn't be for your unbelief, it'd be for the poor supply of water that you have. <laughs> so here's the commentary. Uh, Psalm 78, much of that is a commentary. Psalm 59, Psalm 34, and so forth. Commentary on the Old Testament. Things that you wouldn't have gotten. Well, just take Psalm 34 for an example. We know that David got delivered from before King Achish, but what did he do after that? Well, he went somewhere else. But what did he do before he went somewhere else? He gave us Psalm 34. Now, Psalm 34 tells us that, but Samuel and Kings don't tell us that. So you have to know Psalm 34 to know that David sat down and wrote all of these 21, 22 verses of his praise now for his deliverance and victory that he has because you wouldn't have found that earlier in the historical books of the Old Testament. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that Psalms provides many times an inspired commentary on some of the compositions that have been given to us earlier. Then one final thing we want to look at is the classification according to subject matter of Sefer Tehillim. And this again is only a, a general classification we could get more specific and give you more details but this will at least uh, give you more information than most Sunday school teachers have about the book of Psalms 
perhaps it'll whet your appetite to do some more study yourself. <coughs> Classification according to subject matter. The first great group of psalms are known as the penitential psalms. I'll give you, a, oh, at least a partial list of the penitential psalms. We'll look at a couple of them to explain what that means. Penitential psalms, 6, 25, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, 143. So if you'll turn back to 32, just for one of these, what is a penitential psalm? Well, certainly all good Catholics would know what that means. <laughs> You know what penance means? Yep. You pay your priest to forgive you of your sins. Yeah. Well, it doesn't actually mean that here, but it means to express sorrow and contrition of heart and repentance for one's sin. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Well, he, well, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. Well, it's a penitential psalm, because he's confessing and repenting of his sins here. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. That, by the way, is the second most famous penitential psalm. What's the most famous penitential psalm? 51. Obviously, 51. Which is another of the psalms that has in its title one of the 14 that gives us historical background information. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Penitential psalm, because he's repenting of his sins. A second type is known as the imprecatory psalm, which are the ones that are most difficult to deal with. The imprecatory psalm. 35, 52, 55, 58, 59, 69, 83, 109, 137, and 140. Let's look at 137. Oh, this gives many people problems. The last three verses of Psalm 137, it's an imprecatory psalm. Now see here again, friends, this is why, this is why you need teaching. Because you just read Psalms and you don't see that they come in classifications and you have to study an imprecatory psalm as being an imprecatory psalm. You can't study it as just being any old psalm there or you'll get a wrong interpretation of what's being said. If it's imprecatory, then you have to study it as imprecatory. If it's penitential, then you have to study it as being penitential and so forth. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee, as thou hast served us. Now look at verse 9. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stone. Well, what a cruel thing to say, because it's an imprecatory psalm. It has a certain place in Hebrew poetical literature and uh, there's no problem if you understand some of the principles for the interpretation of psalms like this. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Well, that doesn't really sound like God, the God of love, or a psalm from a man of God who was after God's own heart, or even one who wasn't after God's own heart, but one who was nearly as good as David. When he says, happy is he, or blessed is the man, that takes your little babies and dashes their skulls against the stone. Imprecatory. You might not know what imprecatory means, but the word sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. But you know that the Psalms are terrible. A third group classification is known as the Psalms of Degree. 
Now these are some of my favorite ones to get into explaining some of the meanings behind them. So I won't do that tonight, but I'll show you where they're found. 120 through 134. You'll turn back to 120 and look at all of these. They're psalms or songs of degrees. Psalm 120, a song of degree. 121, a song of degree. 122, a song of degree. And all the way through 134, you have your classification known as the psalms of degrees. Then another classification is the Hallel Psalms, H-A-L-L-E-L. And these are Psalm 113 through 118. 113 through 118. Notice that I don't believe any of them have titles to them because they all fit in the, this category. Then we have what I've given you some of before, our acrostic psalms. I'll give you a small list of our acrostic psalms. 9, 10, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, the most famous one, 119, and 145. Acrostic psalms. Remember what that means? The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are used to introduce either each verse or each group of verses, such as eight verses in a group in Psalm 119. Generally, just each verse or maybe two verses would go along with it, but Psalm 119 is unique in that it's got eight verses per section, and you go all through the 22 letters of the 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet. Another group is the Hallelujah Psalms, sometimes confused with the Hallel Psalms, but I like to keep them separate because they're found in two different portions, so obviously they've got to be kept separate. The Hallelujah Psalms, where are those? They're at the end, 146 through 150. So you've got five Psalms here. 146 through 150, the Hallelujah Psalms. If you'll turn to Psalm 146, they're called this because the very first word and the very last word of each of these five psalms is the Hebrew word hallelujah, which you'll get sometimes at least in your margin. Generally, you'll just get the translation, praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. 146, notice the very first verse, the very last verse, the same as 147, 148. 149, 150. They all start, praise the Lord. They all end, praise the Lord. So they're known as the Hallelujah Psalms. And I believe that leaves us with one more classification, which is the most important of classifications, and those are our Messianic Psalms. Now, I'll try to give you some of these in order. This is certainly not all of them, but some of these in order as they typify the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the order of the Psalms, 1, 2, 3, 4. It might be 3, 7, 1, 10. But they'll be in the order that they typify and therefore predict the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why they're called Messianic Psalms, because they are predictive and the prototypes of the Messiah. Let's see, we'll start then with what he was before anything else, and that is divine, his deity. It's Psalm 45. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Well, he's calling him God, in other words, in verse 6. Thy throne, O God. So he's divine, in other words. So that is his deity. Secondly, his humanity. We find this in Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8, which the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 takes this and applies it to Christ. Thirdly, his sonship, Psalm 2, very famous psalm for the sonship of Christ. Fourthly, his rejection, 
Psalm 118. Fifthly, his betrayal. So you see, all of the life of Christ is dramatized right before our eyes here in the book of Psalms. His betrayal, Psalm 41 and verse 9. Then his suffering, Psalm 69. Then his death in Psalm 22. His resurrection in Psalm 16. His glory in Psalm 72. And his priesthood in Psalm 110. For a complete list.